Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Brian Montalvo of Keenison Knives. Now, I know very little about Keenison Knives besides the fact that they are exceptionally beautiful modern folders. They're created by knife makers in the heart of Texas, and now that they've earned one of the most esteemed awards in the business. I first took note of Keenison after hearing viewers and listeners urge me to check them out in their amazing custom wares on Thursday Night Knives, and I'm glad I listened. We're going to peel back some of the mystique and find out about Keenison Knives and the people that make them, but first, like, comment, subscribe, and share the show if you would be so kind. And also download the show to your favorite podcast app so you can listen on the go. And as always, if you want to help support the show, you can do so on Patreon. Quickest way to do that is to head over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Hey, Ryan, welcome to the show. Hey, Bob, how you doing? I'm doing great. Hey, thanks for doing this uh, so so quick, hot on the heels of Blade Show Texas. Yeah, it was a great show. Um, my horse, my voice cuts out. It's because uh, we talked too much at the show. I hear that. Well, I want to congratulate you on your win there. Uh, you won Best Mac uh, 2023. What is a Mac? Yeah, it's a new category they just came up with uh, for this show this year. Uh, just because... You know, the, the industry is moving, well, not moving. Uh, our, our segment of the industry is growing so much that um, they felt it uh, necessary to add a category. So MAC stands for Machine Assisted Custom. K stands for knife, so Machine Assisted Custom. Uh, basically implying that you need to do something with an automated machine and then do some things by hand on, on the knife. So, um we do all our knives primarily by hand. The only thing we did on that one that was machine uh, automated was uh, the water jet process. We get our blanks water jetted in Maynard, Texas, uh, just outside of town here. So that qualified us for the category. But uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's a lot of fun. A lot of great makers in that category, and uh, a lot of friends of mine. And so lucky to uh, have won that one this year. Uh, to me, from my perspective, it seems like that is uh, that's how most custom knives are made uh these days um you know um and and i could see how uh it, it almost seems like they should make a a category for the other kind you know the the kind where the blank is cut out with a jigs or with a uh bandsaw uh, something like that yeah uh, i mean i it's it's kind of new uh we you know we've been shooting for these these awards for several years now um and each show is different you know we talk to them in Utah about the categories. They didn't have a, a tactical folder category in Utah last year for Blade Show West. Um, and, and they try to tailor the categories for the amount of, of people exhibiting to make sure that there's enough people in each category. Mm. Um, so after some conversation, we put, or they put together the Mac category um, so that, you know, it kind of included a few different types of knives. Uh, the only <laughs> The only uh, real contingency there is it couldn't be a uh, lockback um, or a uh, slip joint. They said no slip joint. So because uh, those slip joint guys are amazing, you know, they put so much work and time into those things that we really, I mean, it, it's hard to compare with a lot of those. Oh yeah, I guess they have to have their own sort of traditionals uh, category or something like that. I, I mean, the the slip joint guys can get into pretty much all of them. I mean, it's an art knife. It's a EDC knife, it's a oh, uh, yeah. slip joint, you know, it, it's just, they're, they're incredible what those guys do. Um, Essex knives, um, I forget where he's from, but he won best in show and best, uh, best slip joint. It was an incredible, I mean, even machine, the corkscrew, it was, it was an incredible, oh, wow, incredible knife. If you get an opportunity to check it out, you absolutely should. Cause he, he deserved every minute of that. So, um, yeah, it was, it, it's, it's interesting the way that they do those things. Um, you know, it's not always necessarily fair or or just the way that it works, but um, we all get in there and do our best every time. That's the best we can do. Yeah. Well, you're dealing with humans on the judging side, and you know everyone's got their 
peccadillos and and that kind of thing. Uh, so I, obviously you've shown at shows before. Is this your first major award like this? It is. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, we've been uh, we've been working for it for several years. Um, it's one of those things that was on my bucket list uh, over the last few years. Was to, I mean, it's a great great metric to see how you you know you. You can't put a lot of value in awards. I mean, it's one of those things where you'd like to do well, but um, it's not everything. Uh, getting out there and making a quality product and have people appreciate it. It's more that you, you're you're recognized by your peers, um, that you're doing, you know, you're, you're moving in the right direction, uh, so to speak. So that that's, that's what means the most about it is, you know, uh, the judges that were in there and the guys that, that uh, kind of bestowed that upon us are some really – really amazing makers that we look up to. And uh, that was the most incredible thing is, you know, being able to be in that room and having all those amazing knife makers, no matter what genre they're in uh, support us. So yeah, it's uh it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And to be recognized by your peers, uh, especially in a crowd like that. Now I've only ever been to blade show Atlanta, but walking in the room the first time a couple of years ago, I remember thinking, um, you know, how the hell do they judge? And then I realized a little bit more of the process, you know, you have to submit. It's not like they walk and look at every knife and judge, right. but still mm -hmm. your, your peers are, uh, you're dealing with the best of the best, you know? Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. And I, I, you know, when I posted the, the, the award on Instagram, it, they're the best in the world. I mean, there's makers from all over the world that, that come to the Blade Show Atlanta and Blade Show Texas and, and all over all of these shows and uh, it's incredibly humbling to think that out of all those knives we we won um still kind of digesting that <laughs> well okay so before we find out more about Keenus and knives what what was the knife that won this uh mac yeah. award uh it's a new knife for us this year we call it the blue tick uh came up with it a couple a couple weeks ago uh, maybe a little over a month ago um it's different for what we make uh i, I like I like to kind of step outside the box with a lot of the knives that we're making. I was talking to somebody this weekend. We don't really do a lot of traditional blade shapes. Uh, I enjoy sketching blades and kind of pulling things together that aren't traditional. But this one's very traditional, which may be why it fit in that category. We call it the blue tick. Um, this one was all titanium handle, mother of pearl inlay, uh, magna cut satin blade um, with a bronze backspacer. So oh, yeah, that is blue tick. beautiful blue tick. And, and it's, it's following on a dog theme that I've picked up on. Uh, one of my yeah. favorite of your knives is the whip it. Um, uh, but uh, before I go any further with that, I know people are going to want to know magna cut. What, what's it, uh, what's, what's your heat treat to on, on the magna cut? Oh yeah. What is it? 2150 for, uh, for an extended period of time. I don't, I don't have it right. Oh, I'm sorry. Not, not, not your recipe. What's, what's the Rockwell? on that oh oh it was uh i think it was around 63 62 oh. 63 somewhere in there cool i can yeah. i can i can hear people applauding and nodding approvingly <laughs> yeah because... well i mean I, I brought up the heat treat because it's one of the most frustrating parts about dealing with that steel is um holding your your heat treat oven at you know 2100 degrees for an extended period of time tends to burn out the heat sink so uh the heat treat process is really the the pain in the butt with it uh, oh, so oh, I could see how going uh, going on a huge batch of that could be difficult. I really uh, think the the shape of that is beautiful. Uh, I think all of your knives have very unique shapes and unique blade shapes. Uh, this one, as you said, looks more traditional, I, I guess. But uh, to, <laughs> to me, it, it looks pretty uh, pretty. Can you would you be so kind as to hold that up so we can sure. so we can take a yeah. take a look? Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's yeah, that, a good, fun profile. We uh, we lifted the backspacer a little bit so you can kind of see the backspacers uh, a little bit higher than the, the rest of the knife there, uh, which was a fun detail. And then the pocket clip was a challenge too. It's got a fun, I don't know if you can see it, fun little chamfer on the on the side there that yeah. was pretty difficult. Um, but yeah, it's it's a you know it's uh, like you said, they're all sorry, my dogs are in the background. They're all unique profiles, but uh, this one's a little bit more traditional for what we do. Uh, that pocket clip, you know, just looking at your background, you can see a lot of cool antiques. The uh, the pocket clip reminds me of the uh, tremolo bar on like an old guitar. You know, it's got yeah. That, oh, absolutely, that absolutely. The, the whammy bar on there. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It, it kind of does. 
Very nice. Well, congratulations again on that award. That's a that's a real feather in your cap. Um, let me ask you about the name Keenison uh, uh, for a second here. When I decided to reach out and and talk to you, uh, I didn't know your name, and I was expecting to see your last name being Keenison for some reason. So, what does Keenison mean, or how did you? What's the name? Yeah, I get that a lot. Uh, people say, Mr. Keenison. Uh, uh, so the company is named after two of our dogs that, that passed before we started making knives, um, Keen and Madison. And we could kind of combine them and make Keenison. Uh, and then, you know, you kind of hit it on the head. All of our stuff is, my dogs are making noise over here. <laughs> All of our knives are dog oriented and, uh, and uh, dog themed, you know, everything we do, the, the dog stickers and uh, branding and all that stuff. So, uh, we try to keep it consistent. Yeah. How, how, uh, how important or, or, uh, yeah. Do you find it to be important or is it just fun that you remain consistent kind of in your naming, um, convention and that kind of thing? I, I think, uh, I, I know a lot of, a lot of makers do it. Um, it's one of those things that I think is important because it, it keeps it, you know, I like to work within structure at some point. Right. Um, I mean, uh, when when you leave it open for anything, any name, any you know, you can name it after a car, you can name it after whatever. Uh, I find I have trouble um, when when you have kind of a theme working and a constraint. I, I always work better with that. So uh, this year we, we did something new. We named all our new models after hounds. So uh, the blue tick hound, basset hound, uh, bloodhound, wolfhound. So uh, it just kind of keeps it keeps it consistent. Uh, next year we'll pick another classification of dog and try to keep it in there. So, um, I, I it, it, it makes my life a little easier sometimes to, uh, to, to work with a theme, but I, I think the, the people resonate with it a lot more as well. Uh, not just dog people, but people that are following along, they kind of know why we're doing it and what we're doing. Um, I know Brian Brown uses a lot of, uh, uh, air theme, air, not, you know, airplanes and, and flying yeah. things. Uh, he, he always wanted to be a pilot. So he, he names after that. Um, Shane at Scorpion six. It's a lot of like Nordic names, I believe. Um, so I think everybody has a little niche, but that, that just happens to be ours. As a collector and, uh, you know, just fan of knives across the entire spectrum. I like it because it doesn't seem random. It seems like it's part of a, of a, an ongoing theme, you know, um, maybe a year and a half, two years ago, the big conversation was, how do you name a knife? I, I that we've run out of names completely. Sure. And, yep. uh, and I would imagine that latching onto something, especially something that you love and have a close connection to like dogs, um, you know, that that's not a problem. It's just, you know, there's, there are other cool dogs and you're going to get inspiration from those. Yeah. How, how did this begin? How did your knife making begin? And, and, uh, you know, how did you step into this? Yeah. Um, so my background is uh, I went to uh, Academy of Art in San Francisco to do industrial design. And I was working as a consumer product designer uh, out of college, trying to bring other people's uh, dreams to fruition. Uh, and it, it was a lot of fun, but, um, you know, it was difficult. I, I had a lot of jobs that weren't weren't as exciting as I wanted them to be. Um, and ended up in the IT industry and, uh, excuse me, my <laughs> dogs. Hey, stop. Ended up in the IT industry, uh, and started building a business with a, my business partner. And I, I enjoyed that, but, um, I got to the point where I have a need to create, you know, I, I was, I was building a business, which was fun, but, um, I wanted to get back into working with my hands and building things. I find it very rewarding. Um, I always say people are usually motivated by uh, accomplishment. And when I was building the business, I felt very accomplished and I felt very satisfied, but came to a point where we were comfortable and in a good position and kind of stable. So uh, I found uh, Rad Cleaver on Instagram. My wife got me on Instagram because I was into guns and things like that. Um, and I found a Rad Cleaver one day on, uh, on Instagram and I contacted Colin and I said, uh, Hey man, how do I get one of these? And this was years ago, because uh, this price is going to seem ridiculous. But he said uh, it's twenty five hundred dollars in six months. I said okay, and he said uh, I need the money up front. Hmm. I said oh okay, it's that kind of thing. Um, so I, I, I 
went to a buddy and I said, hey, man, I, I think if you can machine this, I'm pretty sure I can get this done. Um, so we, I came up with the Stray. The Flipper Stray was my first design. Uh, and we had some water jet uh, blanks cut and started trying to make a knife. Um, so we, I think I, I had six sets that we, we cut. Um, and we went to town on doing that. And it was right before Blade Show 2016, I think, 20, 2015, 2016. And we were working really hard to get out. We were going to go to Blade Show. It was our first time. So we were working really hard to get some knives done. Um, and out of six knives, we kind of finished two. Mm-hmm. And I uh, took him to Atlanta and started showing people. And uh, you're going to hear me talk about the knife community multiple times tonight, I'm sure, because one of the things that was so rewarding was the reaction we got from people. I mean, looking back, they were not great knives. I mean, I have one locked away somewhere, um, never to see the light of day, because <laughs> I-, I wouldn't look back and say what an accomplishment we did. But it was the knife community, people looking at them and saying, yeah, this is this is pretty good. Like you, you can you can do this. You can If you really put your mind to it, you can you could really improve this. Um, and the advice we got from older makers, right? We had a little, little lock rock in there and went over to a couple other makers and they said, oh, here's, here's what you're doing. You know, your stop pin's a little low and lock up should be here. And um, so, you know, it's that kind of community where an older knife maker isn't threatened by the young guy coming in. They're actually more than happy to help you uh, step forward and, and improve the product so that you can push the industry a little further, um, which is so much fun. I mean, I, I encourage new micro- makers to do that all the time. So, um, so yeah, that's what really got us going. We, we uh, caught the bug from there. And then, you know, I was coming home every night at, you know, uh, after work, I'd have dinner with the family, uh, put my kids to bed and go outside to the garage from you know eight eight thirty to one in the morning and try to make knives. I mean, okay, so you you jumped right in to the most, I mean, arguably the most difficult kind of knife to make, uh, a modern uh, tactical style folder, locking folder. Um, oftentimes, uh, almost always, it seems like people start uh, with fixed blades and gradually, um, you know, find themselves making folders or, or take the jump into folders and it's a concerted um, sort of effort. Um, uh, what kind of challenges did you come up against starting with folders? All of them. Uh, <laughs> there are so many, still to this day, there are so many things about making folding knives that, that are frustrating. Um, when you're starting off, it's just, it's terribly irritating. If, if you're a perfectionist like I am, it's, it's not going to be perfect no matter how many times you want it to be in, the, in in that initial process. I mean, I've, I've met some great makers. I'll take that back. I made some, met some great makers that pulled it off, but um, I'm, I'm very stubborn. I like folding knives. I like the fidgety factor of them. I like the, the break on the detent, the lockup. Um, and those are the things that still keep me interested. Um, I recommend that any knife maker start with fixed blades, but, uh, but yeah, we, uh, we, we jumped right into folders just because it was, that's what we were into. Uh, not fully understanding the challenges that were in front of us, but uh, but remaining consistent and trying to do it again and again and again and improving the product and, and still trying to improve the product. You know, and like I said earlier, we've entered these awards before and fallen short, but it was one of those, you got to do better. You got to understand what you're doing wrong and, and continue to step up. Um, and uh, I, I'm motivated by all the other makers around me. Um, that and uh, you know that's that's one of the benefits of going to these knife shows is that uh, you have so many great makers around you and you get to feel the product you get to talk to them about what they're doing and and see their challenges and because we're all willing to share our challenges and and the things that we've improved on and how we're doing it because I tell people all the time I could explain to you how to make a folding knife but the real challenge is understanding how to correct it when it com- goes wrong without ruining the whole thing mm-hmm. uh, and that just comes with time and experience. Especially with the kind of materials you're dealing with, um, uh, you know, even if you're not dealing in super exotic materials, it's all expensive, blade steel, titanium, you know, it, and the time you put into it also equals money. So, yeah, you don't want to have to throw it in the scrap heap or the or the bucket of unfinished knives, you know. We all have them. We all have them. <laughs> I, I know uh, I, uh, Natty from Black Snow Knives is one of one yeah. of my influences that I've always looked up to his work. 
and when he, you know, started messaging me and saying, Hey, how are you doing this? Or how, you know, um, how are you working with this deal? That was a big pride moment for me. It was, uh, very interesting. I, I, I kind of took a step back and thought, wow, I, I must be doing something good. Um, but I, I know I've, I've worked, uh, talked to him about some of his builds where he said, Oh, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to put this one in the box then, uh, which <laughs> a black snow, you know, his standard is here for most of us. It was probably a, just a fine knife. Right. I mean, right. it probably worked just great, but it wasn't quite where he wanted it to be. Um, but yeah, we all have a big box of knives that will never see the light of day. Um, and I get offered money for them all the time because they're not horrible. It's just not where it needs to be. But the, you can't can't put that out in the world. You have to keep yeah keep your standard. Someday that might uh, that might <laughs> that knife might end up on the secondary market, and then someone gets a hold of it and they don't know the backstory about how it was negotiated for and how it's a, yep. a second or whatever. Um, it, it's interesting uh, how sometimes people like yourself who already have a love of a certain type of knife, like these kind of uh, modern folders, and you have your you already have your preferences for how it should feel uh, on the release of the lock and the detent break and all, all of the things that as a, someone who loves knives and fidgeting with them, you already know going into it, what you're trying to achieve. And then it, and then it also seems like there are some makers who, um, and this is in no way uh, a, a, a diss, but who, who rely on uh, feedback from, from the crowd. Oh, we want, we want this to, to feel more like this. We want this to be more like that. And then they can assimilate that and perfect their craft. How much do you uh, rely on or not on feedback and, and that kind of thing? I think feedback's always important. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't mind listening to everybody's input on, on what we do. I, I, I don't get offended. I mean, even if somebody doesn't like what we're doing, I, I totally understand it. it. It might not be for them. Um, but uh, at the same time, I feel like sometimes when you're asking somebody, hey, is this okay? Or, hey, what kind of detent do you like? Sure, some people like a strong detent. Some people like a, a lighter detent. They want the blade to fall. But if you'll ask them honestly, what they want is a crisp break, the blade to fall, the lock to work. I mean, it's it, to me, sometimes it's a, a moot question because you know what you want, right? You want it to work. You want it to flip every time. You want it to not fall out when you shake it. You want the lock to be so solid that you could, you know, hammer a nail with it. Sometimes it's, that's an odd expectation. You shouldn't expect that from our stuff, but, um, but you know, there's all those, always those people. Um, and I find, I, I have found in what we do that um, you, you know what you're shooting for. And if you really need to ask, I mean, you probably, if you search your soul, you, you know, the answer to it. Um, so I like the input. I like people telling me, you know, we took all our prototypes to Blade Show Texas this this for this year, um, and I liked watching people interact with them, uh, flip them, uh, and you know some some geometries might not be perfect, so I got to go home and change them and make the alterations so that it flips a little easier, so that everybody's a little bit more pleased with it. But again, I mean, even if that knife is perfect, you know, like no, this one's far from perfect, but you know, it, it was good enough to to get some accolades. It still doesn't mean that it's you know everybody's knife or that everybody's going to be into it. Um, somebody is always going to dislike things. I added some pretty heavy jim jimping to the top of this blade um, up here. Yeah. And although I like it and, you know, I, I put my thumb on it before it went and it's, it's not sharp enough to cut you or anything like that. But I got a lot of input from people that said it was too aggressive and they weren't into it because it was, it looked, it looked like a little bit much. But uh, when I went back and tried to make it smaller and, and adjust it, the blade didn't look, look right um it looked too fat and it added a lot of weight to it that visual weight to it that i mm -hmm. i didn't want in there so um excuse me <laughs> hey so uh you make you make design decisions based on the input that you have and and the goal that you're trying to get at um because that that has a lot to do with it right so it's it could be kind of a numbers thing, especially when you're bringing prototypes to a place like blade and uh you know several hundred people are handling it. Um, and you get a preponderance of um, comments on the same thing. Ah, this hurts my finger. You need to take a little bit off of the, the flipper tab. Now, I don't know if people are that bold to be talking to someone uh, such as yourself in, in that kind of way, um, because, that, you know, 
Uh, but still, you might you might get the idea that there are certain things that need to change just just through the sheer numbers. Um, sure. By the way, this is the you know not neither here nor there. I love that big style jimping. It reminds me of some of my you know big beefy uh, tactical um, fixed blade knives. You know, and and yeah. I, I do love that. I also incidentally love the way it feels. Uh, I love big big jimping, just the way it feels on the thumb. Um, yeah, that was one of those it, things you know, that it, jumped out. If you look at a lot of our designs, I, we don't use it a lot at all. You know, even the even the gentle jimping. A lot of our a lot of my first designs are uh, very sleek and modern and kind of seamless. And we didn't go into a lot of that stuff, partially because we weren't set up for it and didn't know what we were doing. Um, and secondary, you know, it's just kind of my style. I like I like the smooth lines and things like that. Um, but with this design, I was really going for something tactical. Um, and, and the, the, you know, something a little bit outside of what we had been doing previously. Uh, and I, I think it went really well. I, I, I like I like getting into genres, right? I mean, I like, uh, you know, if I'm trying to the whip it, I was going for kind of a stiletto look, right? Something yeah. thin and long and pointy, um, which I got there, but a flipper tab is not very much st a stiletto, right? Um, it's just something that I felt like fit the design and, and worked well with it. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I get it. I, it's a, uh, it's a preference thing. And, and, and I, I like to touch a lot of different factors in there. And I think that one worked out. Uh, so as Jim is scrolling uh, through your page, I see, uh, you know, I, I see certain, well, each knife kind of looks different, but they all look like they're coming from the same hand. Um, how do you go about designing a knife? Do you get an idea for something that you want to accomplish with the knife and then start drawing? Or is it more of an automatic process? How does that work? Yeah, I appreciate that. Actually, um, my, my buddy Israel from Arcane Design came out last year uh, to build a knife with us. And uh, excuse me. And he said the same thing. He, he said, uh, you know, they all look very different, but I can see your influence on in all of them. Uh, you know, he said I have a, kind of a, a a vibe that goes with all the different knives, which I, I actually disagree. Um, <laughs> I don't see it all the time, but I, I like to start with blade shapes. Um, excuse me, I'm gonna let these dogs out real quick. All right. Hey, come on. So, looking at the uh, looking at those blade shapes, uh, that's how you like to start. Yeah, I always I always start with those. I, I like to sketch the blade first. Uh, that's for some reason, that that's what really gets me attached to a design is is the um, I'm going to say speed of it. You know, the, the lines pulling a line across a page and and then making it cohesive in a style that I can grind. Um, that's always where I start. Uh, our, one of our more iconic designs is called the Alpha, um, and I was sketching the Alpha. It started as a cleaver, and I kind of took a little bit off here, and I changed the angle there, and then kind of turned into a sheep's foot. Um, and then I remember drawing the line to kind of abbreviate the front of it and looking at it and saying, yeah, that's it. You know, that, that's something I can work with. Um, and then what I really enjoy about designing folders versus fixed blades or anything like that is then you can take that blade and you have to make it nest in something else, right? Yeah, this is a cool blade shape, but can I take that blade shape and make it nest in something functional? Um, and that's what really got me addicted to folders was that that, you know, again, working in that restriction to say, I can't just do whatever I want. I have to make this now come in here and fit the function in there and get the detent right and the lockup. And, uh, you know, um, those are my favorite things about it. So I, I always start with the blade shape first, uh, get something that works, and then I'll, I'll put it in. I'm pretty basic. I put it in Adobe Illustrator and I, I trace out my blade shape and then I start pulling some lines and getting some function put in there and seeing if that works. And I've designed a lot of blade shapes that absolutely could not nest in something. It just, uh, or they could, but it, it wasn't, didn't seem functional to me. Um, you know, the, the back of the handle was lower than the, the bottom of the blade or, it just, you know, it just didn't work out. Um, so I've abandoned a lot of designs because of that, but um, it's interesting. I, I, like you said, the, the page looks very different, right? Every knife has a little bit a different flair in it, but um, it, it's, uh, it, they all have a similar vibe as, as far as, you know, how they go in a lot of blade in a little package or, um, you know, I, I try to push it in that aspect a lot. 
that's actually something I was going to mention. I'm I, I'm unabashedly shallow and looks really uh, when it comes to knives <laughs> and looks <laughs> looks really mean a lot to me. Uh, and something that your knives uh, really have in spades uh, is the handle to blade ratio is so good to me, like pleasing. You know, it, it's the right amount of handle for the amount of knife sometimes. And this is this is just my my cursory analysis sometimes you know you can achieve that from a fatter blade and a thinner handle or or you can kind of you know do a sort of uh measuring and say uh, you know it's 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 exactly a half inch from the pivot and therefore it is a, a perfect uh, you know from the center of the pivot to the end whatever it is uh you can see it looks like the blade and the handle are almost the same size. And for some reason, that's really important to my eye. And that's that's one of those unifying characteristics of your designs, I think. Yeah, I, I have a hard time, and it's it's challenging because I have a hard time um, uh, fitting, you know, the fasteners in there sometimes because I, I don't want to add a bunch of material to the back of the knife, and that, that becomes very challenging at some point. Uh, I, I just I, I saw you guys scrolling through the page. We just announced this today. This is a, our first production knife. And I think it's a pretty good example of what we're talking about with a, a lot of blade and a little package. I mean, um, the, the tip here, although you can't, you know, it's important you don't catch your finger on it. So you're not going to catch your finger on it, but it goes all the way back there. And when it's open, it's actually a pretty large, you know, for, for a small knife, it's a lot of blade in there. And to your, your point, the proportion, it looks like all this blade is about the same length here. Um, but I believe the blade is, uh, to the end here, it's about three inches. And then the blade overall is just under seven. So there's significantly more on the back. It just doesn't really have that look to it. Which knife is this? Okay. So this is, a uh, our first production knife. We're going to do with Riot. We're calling it Fido. Fido. Um, the Fido. So it's, uh, it's a flipper knife. It's got one of those little micro flipper tabs on the back. It's kind of hard oh, to see. Sweet. Um, yes. See if yes. I can get it in there. So it's a tiny little little button there, and then you just kind of pull down on it, light switch, not button, um, that opens it. This was one of the things I was talking about at Blade Show, watching people interact. It was the first time that we'd had it out where people could see it. Um, and with that little flipper tab, we were kind of curious if people, you know, it, it jumps out of there, it works really well, and we're flipper knife guys, or, you know, folding knife guys. Um, so it was easy for us, but getting it on the table and watching people walk up and pick it up, uh, whether they were folding knife people or not, and be able to open it, which uh, I would say 96% of the people walked right up, kind of looked at it, couldn't figure out what was going on, and I explained it. And uh, as soon as they got it once, it was they were really pleased with it. So um, we got a really good, uh, really good response on that. We did it in titanium and uh, carbon fiber as well. Mm. So this is the black DLC in carbon fiber with brass. Wow. I, I got to say, well, first, a couple of things. Uh, uh, first, I'm surprised that 96% didn't know. I, I thought you were going to say intuitively drag their finger across that. Oh, no, uh, no. Yeah, I mean, they, they, I don't know if it was intuitive. But you almost can't see it. Right? I, got, I mean, it, I got you. when you look at it, you almost don't know how to open it. They would they kind of pick it up and look at it and do one of these, you know, your grandfather's uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. knife. And then I'd say, oh, there's a little button on the back. And, and 96% of people did, you know, pull their, their finger down and get it. Nice. Um, the ones that couldn't get it really, really struggled with it. So, uh, I, I love the cutting edge. I love the shape of that blade. I love the way it dips down, has a belly. It reminds me a little bit of a, like a traditional Spanish knife, uh, at least the, the cutting edge part of it. it it's really pretty. That's great. I appreciate that. I'm actually, I'm majority Spanish and a Spanish citizen. So, Oh, um, wow. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is fun that you say that, but yeah, that's probably a little bit of my heritage in there coming out. That is cool. So, and Riot, how has it been working with Riot? Uh, you you you're a maker of your own fine fine knives, and then you hand over a design to them. How how did that feel? Um, I, I'll tell you what. Uh, the reason that we've waited so long to do this is because I feel like uh, Riot makes an extremely quality product uh, and I was anxious to work with them out of everybody else. Now, you know, uh, again, the industry pushes each other up, right? Uh, at the time that we had kind of gotten into this, uh, it was almost two years ago. Um, 
the the standards were being raised up a little bit here, up a little bit there. Um, they're, they're all great companies. You know, we look forward to working with all of them. I'd love to do a wee knife. I'd love to work with Best Tech. But to me, especially with this little design and the little flipper, um, Riot makes a really quality product. It's they're not always the easiest to deal with, unfortunately. I wish that was a little bit different, but um, there was really no problem in handing off my product to them. I knew that they were going to do a great job with it, and they did. Um, this, I think most makers would hesitate to send a little flipper tab knife like that to, to anybody just because it takes a lot to make that work properly. Um, and they nailed it the first try. Uh, I made some revisions on the aesthetics, but even the first, I have one of the first prototypes here. I changed it up a little bit. Um, this one had a little bit different blade shape than the other one, but they, they made it, you know, I pulled it out of the package and it just flipped exceptionally. It's going to be hard to see the changes there, but this one has a little bit more of a hesitation on the bottom of the blade here. That was, yeah. My yeah. camera was better, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I haven't, I mean, they, they've been fantastic with their product and, and working with us and, and taking our input and saying, eh, you know, that's not what we do, but here's how we do it. And, uh, you got to trust them. They make a lot of quality knives. So I'm, I'm not going to sit there and tell them their business. Um, I'm going to tell them what I want and, and hopefully they can accomplish that. And, and they certainly have. So I'm, I, I would love to work with them more. Um, hopefully a little bit faster next time. <laughs> yeah, I, actually, I'm not surprised to hear that they nailed it uh, first time out. I, I too love we and best tech and have immense respect uh, for for all three of those companies and and others, uh, but Riot they seem to have um, to date nailed the most um, in terms of variety of designs and innovations uh, that that are coming from knife makers such as yourself. Uh, so you know that little tiny flipper tab that's not something we've seen too often, and to to send them that and have them have them just nail it. I would imagine a lot of that relies on exact ness in the layout of the pivot area i mean I, that's yeah about as... uh, yeah it's a geometry thing right the leverage of having this above above your pivot area um and your lockup and all those things uh so that you get that proper leverage without laying on it too much uh and getting enough area you know that we angled the top of this so that your finger mm -hmm. kind of pulls down the top of it and, and hits that button but you know it folding knives is a is amalgamation of so many different little things that make it work right and uh and get that thing working that um so that it does everything you want every time it's very difficult um and and rewarding to to people such as myself who uh you know the 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 moniker knife junkie is kind of a joke but it's kind of not you know and uh there are so many knives that i love or and that i see and that i want and um so many of them are out of reach i'll just put it that way and to to be able to know that i can get a fido somewhere down the road is exciting because looking at your knives they are labored over exquisitely that the materials uh are sometimes they look absolutely insane uh, tell me a little bit about your process uh, in the actual making of your of the Keenison knives, your custom knives, and um, and the materials you use. How, what what dictates where you go with that? I mean, it 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 seems very exotic. Yeah. So uh, again, my background's in industrial design. Um, I love materials. Um, it's really what got me into this. You know, black Damascus and um, Zerk and, and, uh, Zerkatai and everything Chad Nichols does and different steels. Um, I was always, you know, I always wanted to play with them. That was, that was really one of the things that got me into making folding knives. Um, but what really pushed us over the edge material wise was, uh, meeting my buddy, Matt from Hawk's Nest, um, Hawk's Nest customs or whatever he calls it. Uh, Matt is a, a material genius. Uh, the things that he knows about micartas and uh, Bakelite and the histories and who made them and where they came from and identifying what it is, uh, it's second to none. I've never met anybody that could do it the way he does it. Um, and I remember seeing one of his posts and reaching out to him and saying, hey, man, I'd love to get some of this. You know, What is it and how do I use it? 
and he helped helped us through the process. Oh, you want to back this or you don't want to back it. You want to leave this there, sand it like this, don't buff it, whatever it was, he'd help us through it. But uh, the more we got to know each other and become friends, the more I just kind of latched on to, to the things he was excited about so that I, I could use them. But the process is really easy. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm a material hoarder, um, especially after knowing Matt. So we have a toolbox in the shop full of carbon fibers and micartas and blade steels and um, all kinds of different stuff. So what I typically do is go into the box and I'll, I'll pull out a blade, um, uh, blade steel and kind of put it on the table and rummage through the box a little bit and say, well, one, you know, how elaborate do we want to get with this? We want to keep it a little bit more simple. Or are we going for the going for the stars here? Um, and uh, just kind of line them up, right? This is yellow. This is red. This is blue. Let's see what else that kind of has some cohesion there. Um, and it's like fashion, a lot like getting dressed in the morning, right? You don't put some green pants with a, you know, bright magenta shirt. I mean, some people do. I'm 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 not that guy. But uh, you know, I, I, it's it's a lot like fashion design or anything like that. You you pick a vibe and a color and things that go together. Um, I'm I'm lucky to work with another guy. His name is Will Walker. He's a, a younger guy that started working with me a couple of years ago. And Will and I will sit down at the table and with a with a bunch of material and kind of go through it and say, well, how about this? What about this? Uh, if we want to use this for a bolster, is that the right thing? You know, can that handle it, or how do we need to to, to approach this? Um, and because we have a lot of those things in in the shop, you can kind of grab each one and put it on the table and see how that works. And uh, and if we don't have everything we need, I I call Matt up and. Uh, he moved from Tennessee to Austin a couple of years ago. So I'm again, lucky enough to be able to say, Hey Matt, I'm, I'm on my way up there. Uh, I need something red, pull some stuff out so that we can look at it and check it out. Um, but now, you know, I, I, it's not just Matt. I mean, there's so many great material companies out there, great carbon fiber companies and, uh, and things like that. Camo carbon is my buddy, Andy. Uh, he was right next to us at blade show Texas last weekend. And he makes a great product. Um, great colors, great carbon fiber. Um, and just like a lot of the carbon fiber guys these days, he's trying to get carbo quartz, uh, equivalent out there so that we have something like that to work with again. But, uh, yeah, I, I just, I love pushing it. I, li I like not doing the same thing again. Um, somebody asked me, well, Hey, why don't you guys just do 10 of the same thing and sell them? Uh, I just, I, not that we can't and not that it's impossible, but at some point I get a little bit bored. Um, <laughs> Uh, just like everybody else, I'm excited to take that material, glue it up or bolt it down, whatever we do, and put it on the sander and contour it and see what colors come out, what patterns come out, and and how they drive together. Uh, we did one for this show, or one of our new models called the Wolfhound, um, and a yeah. great, great guy, uh, Micah Dunn, MD Edgeworks, had sent me this little billet of his feather Damascus last year, and it was sitting on my table, uh, and it you know, I, I couldn't find the right project for it. It was a little thinner than we usually work with. Um, but all the knives I came out with this year are a little bit thinner, a little bit lighter. And then I saw Alpha Knife Supply come out with this new pattern. It, I, I don't know what they call it, but it was kind of a V, just like the feather pattern was. And I said, well, that's that's it. I mean, I need that piece and I need to pair it with this blade. Uh, and we need to put it on this knife just because all the lines kind of kind of went together like that. And it was pretty awesome. It, it came came out really well. But I think it, you know, just like anybody, you have that eye, and if you're if you're into it, you know, if you're into cars or whatever it is, you keep keep your ear to the ground and you find what's new and what people are into, and uh, and you you kind of have a feeling you know what you're going to do with it. But I have, like I said, I have so much stuff at the shop now: Westinghouse and antique this and, uh, and rag that, and yeah. you know, it's it's fun. I love that. I love what. So you're you're talking about you know everybody's eye is a little bit different, and I. I I am a more of a Westinghouse micarta guy, I guess, or just a micarta guy, uh, oftentimes. And um, one thing that I see in Keenison knives is um, you don't have what I sometimes call the Mister Furley issue. You remember Mister Furley from Three's Company? You know, oh, yeah. he'd always he'd have some crazy shirt and a crazy leisure suit yeah, the, and a scarf and the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it's like all these conflicting patterns, and and you can take patterns and put them together and have them harmonize, or you can just take patterns and kind of put them together. And to, you know, it's not something I can explain what looks good to my eye, but it, yeah. it seems, it seems like, um, the way you combine materials, 
uh, with uh, Mr. Walker, uh, you have just the right amount without going overboard, without without dazzling too much. And you can you have the ability to look at the rest of the knife as well as the materials. Yeah, you got to let them sing. I mean, uh, again, it's it's a lot like fashion, right? If you have uh, pinstripe pants, you don't always want to pair it with a, a different, you know, uh, what do you call it? The, the, uh, like polka dots and... Right, Paisley's crazy shirt, right? That. Yeah, it Paisley, that's what I was looking for, a Paisley shirt. Um, yeah. Again, people do it. it. It's not unheard of, and some people pull it off really well, but um, I, I'm a, I consider myself a little bit more understated. Um, you got to have something that's the star and something that's kind of the secondary read, the secondary um, uh, aspect of what's going on. So if you take a, you know, a, a sandwich Westinghouse micarta that has a lot going on, a lot of patterns, a lot of textures, you don't want to put that next to something else that has a lot of texture. Otherwise, it's going to take away from it. So right. do something a little bit more solid, something that's going to going to kind of jive with it. Um, but yeah, I, I try to be very conscious of that, not, not overdoing it, not putting too much in there, but letting the materials be, be the star fashion and, and food too. Right. I, I love, I love food so much, yeah. but, um, it, you know, when somebody puts a plate together, they try to let the, the feature be the feature. You want to taste that beef or that fish or whatever it is so that it's the star of the show and everything else is just kind of making it better. Um, I, I like to do that with knives uh, and the Damascus steels, right? I mean, we're, we're talking about the handle materials, but a lot of the Damascus steels are just epic these days. And the yeah. things that Baker Forge and Chad Nichols and Vegas Forge, the things that they're doing with these patterns and, and the cord steels, it's, it's so great. Um, the guys at Vegas Forge are some close friends of ours. I mean, they all are, all those guys are, are close friends of ours, but um, Jesse and Jeff, uh, I've known them for a long time and, they're really pushing their patterns a, a, a lot, you know, adding, you know, rose and all these other things, rosebud. Uh, and when you grind them, they look completely different than they did before you started. And uh, you can't always know what that's going to look like, but you hope that, you know, if this has a lot of lines, then let's make that work with something else. But it's something I'm, I'm very passionate about. I, I love the materials. I love putting that stuff together. And um, I think a lot of what we do is, not not necessarily frowned upon or nobody's scared to do it necessarily, but it's, it's again, it's untraditional to use materials in the way that we use them sometimes. Um, so again, that's a challenge. Uh, we've, we've learned that some things have to be backed more than others. And um, some of the styles that one of my major influences is Peter Carey. Um, oh, yeah. I think Peter uses materials exactly the way they should be used. When he uses carbon fiber, it is, amazing it's 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 gonna sit perfect it's i mean he he's done it for so long he knows what works he knows what doesn't work he knows what's going to pick up in the corner um he knows what he likes to do and what he doesn't like to do uh, and and most of all of his knives are fastened you know a couple extra screws here and that's what holds the scales on whereas a couple of the knives we do we we try to back, we just did one uh last week that had a a copper backing on some brown paper micarta kind of tortoise shell with some jade g10 and a copper line running between it right so I, we had a vision for what it was i needed to break up those two surfaces i wanted copper in between so then we also did copper on the back so that it all kind of jived together um and will has a great influence on that as well you know sometimes i come up with an idea and he comes over and says listen this backspacer is not going to look right when we line all this and squish it together so let's go pick something else um so it, it's uh it doesn't always hit right the first time but sometimes we have to do it again but you know it, we, I think we both have that eye where we, we know when it's when it's good and when it's bad and and, and we have the um, confidence to go back and change it if it's not right. Well, it must not have been easy finding uh, someone whose aesthetic resonates with yours so easily. Yeah, I mean, not always, right? I mean, uh, there's there's always somebody driving and somebody telling you uh, when you should swerve right um so i i i'd like to think that i have I, i'm sitting behind the wheel sometimes and then will knows you know what to say when it's not right but um yeah, yeah it, it, it i think we've we've yeah. been doing this together for now for i think five or six years and and i think uh at least initially he may not have been as much on board as he is now but i think he's seen the progress of what we've done and people's response and i, I think it uh I, 
he doubts me less sometimes when I throw things out there. Uh, I, I'll always throw out something crazy, right? For the next show, I don't know what we're going to do, but you know, we did one with with uh, camo, or I'm sorry, uh, camo carbon '80s colored carbon fiber, and then we inlaid pink and orange bakelite oh. whole, you know, buttons in it. Um, so we'll milled out the the carbon fiber and turned down uh, pieces of bakelite to fit each hole that he drilled. And then we set them in there. Uh, it was crazy. And when I came up with it, I think I sat there and I said, hey, Will, I got a crazy idea here. Bear with me. I know this sounds ridiculous, but I think it's going to be neat. Uh, and it was. It was It was received really well. But that's what I'm talking about. I mean, it's not something everybody would do. And a lot of people probably looked at it and said that's absolutely ridiculous. But, you know, it, it worked and we did it. And some people liked it and it it pushed it a little, pushed a little bit further, right? Like we talk about. Well, those those guys weren't there then. You know, they were probably all <laughs> born in the '90s. They have no idea. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. You got it. <laughs> so your um, your business model seems to be uh, kind of like a, a painter m- might operate or a sculptor might operate in that. Um, well, like you said before, you're not you're not making ten of the same thing. You're really, you know, you have a design or or a um, you know, a catalog of designs, and when you decide to make a certain knife, that's when you pull the pull the paints and the and the chisels together and kind of figure out what you're going to do with it. Um, yep. Is that is that uh, is that um, the way you want to run the main part of the business and then kind of uh, do your collaborations with Riot for for you know expediency or uh yeah i'm okay so you know somebody came up to me early on in what we were doing and multiple people and said you know this isn't just a knife this is art right and and i kind of i don't love that i mean i i appreciate it it is art it's pocket art right i mean what we what all these guys try to do is is make something better and, and create art um and so I started approaching it that way. I think initially when we started, we, like when we when we did our alpha, our, our first alpha run, we tried to do 10, 10 knives, all black DLC coated, you know, slight variations here and there, but that, that was it. We were going to do 10 of them. Uh, and it came out and, and people enjoyed it. But I, I think after that, I really realized that it's not as artistic as it could be. You know, if we're making art, let's make it artistic. Let's let's make it unique. You know, I, everybody likes a lithograph, but everybody wants to own the original. Right. Um, so that's kind of how I see this is I need, we realize we can only make so many knives. I mean, uh, one of the, and it's a great problem to have. One of the problems we have right now is we just can't make enough. We can't make them fast enough. Um, and I want to continue to do that. And the reason for, you know, these Riot or we have a, a U.S. production knife coming out with HM, Jim Vandevelt from HMC Knives, oh, no. uh, hopefully in the next few weeks or months. Um, that That's what keeps the lights on, right? It's, it's making handmade knives one-off is is a very difficult business. And again, it's not not that we don't get paid for them, but nobody sees the ones we throw in the bucket, right? We don't, we don't post the sob story of how terrible this one was and we throw it away. It doesn't say anything good about us, how many we've screwed up and, uh, it doesn't, you know, it's not going to play any violins and, and, you know, some sympathetic ear that, oh, you messed it up. No, I mean, you, you want to know that your maker is is doing the right thing. And, and if you accomplish it better and faster and more efficiently than the next guy, it doesn't make it less, it makes it more. Um, so the 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 production stuff is, is what allows us to be more artistic, hopefully, um, because we've done well with this, but um again it's it's really terribly difficult to make uh one-off handmade knives it's it's not a money maker it's more of a a labor of love is what i tell people because we do love it i mean and and just like natty at black snow i mean you spent so much time on this thing at any given point you can screw it up right until you put it in the box and and even then when you take it to the show somebody drops it it's over um so you can't put all those eggs in that basket you got to do something else so we're hoping that the production industry will, will give us a little bit of breathing room so that we can keep doing this. Uh, Natty of Black Snow, he's a isn't he a jeweler? Didn't he start as a jeweler? Yes, he was a jeweler and, and uh, amazing. He and Lee Lerman are incredible. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, who, who are your customers? What 
What kind of knife guy or gal buys your knife? It's a really interesting question. I get asked that, especially initially when I told people I was going to be a knife maker. They, they'd always ask me, who buys that? Uh, it's, it's a really broad segment, right? Um, I would love to tell you it's, it's, a, it's a bunch of guys driving Lamborghinis, but that, that's <laughs> really few and far between. Um, there are some serious collectors out there that can drop a lot of money on a knife like that, uh, but it's a very small segment. Um, I, to answer that, I get everybody from you know CEOs of major companies to kids in dorm rooms, and I, I don't know how those guys are putting together a couple grand to buy knives, but um, I think in in the knife industry, as you grow into it, you kind of start with a benchmade, uh, and you you have ten benchmades, and then you see you know a, a, a small custom or you know a limited custom run knife and you sell five bench maids and you 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 know level up to that next one and then when you've saved for two of those you, you kind of say hey I, I like that one now so you sell those two and you kind of step up the game to that next one um so it's i think that's what keeps it broad is that that trade up kind of thing where when when people sell their furniture on ebay and buy a car or something uh it, it's always possible to to take your collection and scale up so, yeah, uh, that that begs the question or, or talking about the materials and the kind of the preciousness of them is they also seem, at least in the design. And like I said, I've never owned one. Um, and unfortunately, I've never even hefted one, but I'm going to have to change that at Blade Show this year. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but I, I'm presuming that they're also built like tanks because you're spending all of this time and energy on each individual one and each one has to pass your muster before uh, you let it leave sure yeah um I, I mean that's the goal right they should all be um more exceptional than than the one before i mean somebody always says what's what's your favorite knife it, it should always be the last one right you should always be pushing a little bit harder and and accomplishing more um yeah i mean i they should be built like things. I think it depends on the knife though too, right? Um, we talk about, you know, the variation between this little guy and this big guy. Um, I consider this a tank. They both function the same way. Both have great lockup. Both can uh, handle the beating. This one's just hopefully going to do it a little bit more, a little bit longer, I guess. I, I don't know how to, how to, how to describe that, but yeah. Um, to that same note though, you know, each knife I, I say has a personality. Um, Production knives, they just work, man. I mean, this thing works every time. It, it locks up perfect. It, it, it jumps out of there. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful knife. Um, I say handmade knives have a warmth. They, uh, they have a, mm -hmm. a personality and identity to them that, that I think is what people are attracted to. Um, some production knives can feel sterile, um, for lack of a better term, and not in a bad way. It hits every point that you want it to. Um, but handmade knives just you know, some of them you pick them up and, and it's, it's like a long lost friend that you've known for years. That knife just spoke to you. Um, it, it did the things you wanted and it, it behaved the way you wanted to the same note though. I've, I've handled my first blade show. Um, I, one of the best things about blade show Atlanta, you said, you know, you said you've been there is the pit, right? Mm. Um, the pit after the show, everybody's got their knives on the table. Some guys with $20,000 worth of knives and, and you walk over and you kind of, hesitate but the, oh yeah pick it up flip it play with it um my first year out there was actually disappointed by a lot of the the handmade knives that i picked up that i had been so reverent about um they didn't jump out of there the way i wanted them to or you know the lock had a little bit of stick it's unfortunate but it happens i mean i, I had a really bad bout of lock stick last month and had to had to work through some of that stuff but um yeah i mean a handmade knife is just a little bit deeper it it, it has you know, like you said, you've looked over everything. You've, you've spent time on the lock face. You've analyzed the detent. You've made sure that it, you know, doesn't have blade wobble, that it centers, you know. These are just the basics, though. Those are the things you have to hit to even be in the conversation. After that, you know, how well does it do that? Does it, is it how smooth is it? How easy is the lock? Is it, you know, is it uh, satisfying? Because sometimes, I mean, we've all picked up production knives where the detent was too strong on this one and it was light on this one, right? right. Um, it, it's the same with productions. I mean, or I'm sorry, with handmaids. It's it's not always a, a foregone conclusion. Some things are better than others, but we try. I mean, it, that's something I learned from. Like, I, I keep bringing up Natty. He's a big influence. Or Peter Carey, man. 
um, they just don't let it leave. You know, if, it, if it's not what it should be, it just can't go out. So um, I think that's one of the things that takes a lot of um, a lot of willpower sometimes is it might be something tiny, something so little that it might not make sense. But, um, but yeah, you, you just, like you said, you expect that when you pick up a handmade knife, it's better than the other thing. That's, that's something you have to strive for. So it, it doesn't always come out that way, but hopefully you accomplish it every time. Right. Well, I, I, uh, I know what you mean about the warmth and the connection you get from a handmade knife. I have, I have a growing collection of handmade fixed blades and uh, most of them, many of them are carryable on a daily basis. I like to carry a fixed blade knife. And uh, and there is that connection to the maker. You feel that direct connection. But also each one, you know, is a little bit different than the others. And uh, and if you've had any input in, in what the materials are, even more so. It's yours, but it's also that maker's knife. Um, and, and that does, that gives you, yeah, a, a different feeling uh, than, than an excellent, uh, you know, production fixed blade. So when you hang up your cleats, you know, years and years down the road, what's the knife that you hope you've made at that point? Like, do you have some fantasy build or some fantasy? Um, I don't want to call fantasy because fantasy knife is a thing, but I mean, do you have some knife that you dream about making? Uh, dream. Yes, I do actually. Um, I recently was lucky enough to meet and befriend Edison from Shark Co Knives, oh. um, and he's he's an amazing amazing maker. Uh, and I've looked up to his stuff for a really long time. One of the thing, a couple of the things, and not me. One of the things that I'm all you know, we're always striving to do better is, um, you know, the gaps on either side of the blade. It, there's a very comfortable place there where the detent works well, and and everything's going to flow, and it's going to fall, and it's going to do all the things you want. And, and you can get comfortable with, with keeping that there. Um, keeping that gap consistent is obviously very important, but it could get thinner, right? It could get closer. It can get Edison's knives. A lot of them, especially his early work, you can fit a piece of paper. You can barely fit a piece of paper between the blade and the, and the scales when it's closed. Um, and I've, I've always admired that. It's, it's incredible the way that he does that. And then to make matters more complicated, then you know, he does these knives with hidden hardware. Natty at Black Snow as well. He brought one to USN last year that was uh, his opiate. And there were no, there's no hardware, right? I mean, there was no pivot. There were no screws. You couldn't see anything. And Edison does it equally as well. I saw one with white carbo quartz that he had done that a friend of mine owns. Uh, and the blade, you know, from the profile, it looked like the blade and the two scales were almost one piece. Wow. And then you open it and, you know, there's no hardware. You can barely see a screw. And it's done just exceptionally. Every every attention to detail mattered. And uh, again, he upped the game by taking something that is very standard and very easy to do and making it more complicated, uh, which is, again, something that I like to do is, is take something that's comfortable and make it more complicated. So those two things, you know, I'm always pushing the tolerances. Um, I would love to do something where I can hide all the hardware. It's really a very complicated process. Um, so the way it's put together and... Uh, I, I'm not, I can't see myself taking a sideways screwdriver and ratcheting it. You know, you, you take these things apart. I tried to count one time, hundreds of times in the process, 300 times, two, you know, 400 times just to get it to work before you, before it goes out the door. Right. Um, and if I have to sit there with a sideways screwdriver and get that little screw out every time, it's going to drive me bonkers. So trying to figure out some alternative way to put a knife together that hides all the hardware so that, um, it's not all visible. That's, that's something that uh, is in my book of things to do. Um, so being able to do that without that sideways screwdriver will be the innovation right there. My God. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Brian, thank you so much for coming on the knife junkie podcast and, and sharing all this with, with us. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, it's been great to get to know you a little bit here and man, I cannot wait to, to try one of your knives at, uh, at blade show or try whatever's left on the table by the time I get to it. Uh, we try to keep them on the table these days so people can play with them. But yeah, I, I look forward to it, Bob. It, it's really a lot of fun. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Don't take dull for an answer. It's the Knife Junkie's favorite sign-off phrase, and now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise, like a t-shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie, long-sleeve tee, and more, even on coasters, tote bags, a coffee mug, water bottle, and stickers. 
Let everyone know that you're a knife junkie and that you don't take dull for an answer. Get yours at thenifejunkie.com slash dull and shop for all of your Knife Junkies merchandise at thenifejunkie.com slash shop. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Brian Montalvo of Kenison Knives. And if you didn't know he was an artist from looking at those beautiful knives, you can tell he is by uh, that instinct to make easy things more difficult uh, in the pursuit of artistic perfection. Uh, really great to meet him. Uh, be sure to join us next week for another interview. And of course, Wednesday, the midweek supplemental, and then Thursday night knives. That, of course, is the start of the weekend, is what I keep hearing. So I'm going to go with that. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.